What's up everybody and welcome back to my channel. If you are new, don't forget to hit the subscribe button so you can go through these unsolved murders and missing persons cases with me every single Saturday. Today's case in particular is one that bugs me and it's bugged me ever since I watched John Lorden's coverage on this case. This is the unsolved murder of Tom Beerson. Um, it is one of those cases where there's just not a lot of information. There's not a lot of leads. Authorities have had a couple years at this point to kind of go through this case, but there's just no answers. And the little bit of information that is there is the kind of information where you know there are answers within that information, but it's just, you can't get to it without others coming forward. So that's exactly why I'm covering this story today. It's definitely one that has been very highly publicized. A lot, a lot of people absolutely adored Tom Beerson and they have not let him be forgotten, but I feel like some sort of pressure needs to be put on. People have got to come forward because this is a messed up situation. So let's just go ahead and dive right on into the case. Tom was 18 years old when he was murdered on September 20th, 2014 in Fargo, North Dakota. Now Tom was a great guy and I don't think I've ever really stumbled across a case like this where majority of the information you find isn't even necessarily about what happened, but about just who they were. And that right there should tell you a lot about Tom. His parents said growing up, he was just such a love bug. He was a happy kid. He was a very well-behaved kid, and he was also incredibly talented. He played basketball, and he was phenomenal at it. I believe one of his very first toys was even an infant-sized basketball. He grew up, and his love for the game just continued. No matter what the weather was like, he would be out there. One. As a skilled ball handler, Tom helped lead the Sabres to their very first state tournament as a junior. He scored 1,000 career points before graduating this past spring. He didn't just play basketball. He really was just a sports person in general. So he played everything he possibly could. He played baseball. He ran track and all of this was varsity. So he didn't just kind of do it. He was all in in everything that he did. He went to a hockey camp at one point. If he wasn't at school or with his friends or at one of his part-time jobs, he was practicing basketball. It was just something that meant the world to him and everyone that knew him knew about his love for basketball. And his sister also said he was just the kind of person where things came easy to him. He was just this talented, easygoing, driven young man. Of course he had his moments as a teenager where he was unorganized or his room was messy or he didn't do something that he was supposed to do or he stayed out a bit too late and got in trouble or he was caught drinking on the weekends. So he was still this typical teenager, but you know, for the most part, he had a ton of opportunity ahead of him and he was willing to do what he had to do to get to that opportunity. He had spent most of his life in Sartell, Minnesota. So this is a different place than where he was murdered. But as soon as he graduated from high school, he had these huge plans. He was always so supported growing up. He was surrounded by a bunch of great people in his community, but his plans ended up taking him to Fargo, North Dakota to attend North Dakota State University to become a nurse. He actually completely dropped basketball, at least in order to go to college. He said he might eventually play it again, but he kind of put basketball and those things in his past in order to really hopefully succeed in his career path. But it only took four weeks for something to go terribly wrong once he started attending NDSU. Tom had been ecstatic to go to college. He was such a social person. He was always described as a social butterfly. He was always kind of the center of attention. He made friends with pretty much anybody. And he knew as well that once he went to college, there were just limitless opportunities that he could grab onto. His family dropped him off at his dorm at the beginning of the school year. And he very quickly made it obvious that he wanted wanted independence. He was so ready to go, so he wanted to unpack his room on his own, set everything up on his own, despite his mom desperately wanting to help him. So they decided to just let him be, let him, you know, do what he needed to do. So they dropped him off, said their goodbyes, and headed back to Sartell. The four weeks that Tom was at NDSU, he had a blast, okay? He was doing everything a typical college student would. He was making friends. He actually had a bunch of friends from his hometown that were attending the same school as him. So he was really having a great time and he was partying 
quite a lot. He had been going out every single night to drink and a lot of the nights he got very, very intoxicated. It wasn't just a little bit, it was just constant, constant partying. Um, it This kind of spiraled him into bad behaviors those first four weeks. So not only was he drinking, but that would then lead him to stay out till the early morning hours. He would end up missing his early morning classes because of that. Apparently he was the kind of person that refused to go anywhere without having a shower first and he just wouldn't wake up on time because of his drinking and then that led him to skip classes. So it was just kind of one thing after another. Uh, there was one night in particular where his roommate remembered that he drank so much that he actually fell off his bed that was about four feet off of the ground and he didn't remember it the next day and then the one thing that kind of slapped reality into him was on September 12th he ended up being pulled over for driving under the influence. Now, I don't know a lot of details about this. I think he was driving on the wrong side of the road and they actually couldn't give him all the sobriety tests, the field tests, because his balance was so bad and he was so intoxicated. So he ended up arrested for this and this kind of showed him he was not doing what he intended to do at college. So he ended up telling himself and his roommate and also his parents that he was going to cut down to going out two times a week and he was gonna buckle down and he was really going to pay attention in school and do the things that he needed to do. So it's a time for a freshman college student to kind of learn a lot of things about themselves. Tom's parents knew he'd been drinking at school. He came home one last weekend pledging to do better. It was a really a wonderful weekend that we had with him. Obviously, we didn't know it was going to happen five days later. So the weekend before he was murdered, he went back to Sartell to be with his family, and they kind of had this big conversation about what he had been doing while at school so far, and that it was just not benefiting him. It would never benefit him. So he made a vow to his parents that he would, again, just stop drinking, stop the partying, cut it back a whole lot. And they ended up having a great weekend, despite kind of this chaotic start to the weekend and his school. They ended up watching home videos and doing all these things that they wouldn't typically do. And by the end of the weekend, he went back and no one really had any idea it was going to be the last time that they saw him. But his parents look back on it now and say, it's so strange that that weekend they did all these things and spoke about all these things and just kind of had this disconnected family time, not knowing what was going to happen later on that week. So the next week at school, he focused just like he said he would. And on Friday, the 19th of September, he settled into his dorm watching his phone around 8 or 9 p.m. according to his roommate. He sent out a tweet sometime around this saying, never thought I would actually be bored on a Friday night. Again, I think this has a lot to do with him trying to cut back from drinking. But plans apparently came along pretty quickly because his roommate said that at around 10 p.m. that night, Tom grabbed his book bag and left. And he didn't tell his roommate where he was going, what he was doing. I'm not sure if that was typical. From what I've seen, him and his roommate were pretty close. Um, his roommate would even wake him up for school in the morning. His roommate was like his alarm clock. So I don't know if it's just odd to me that he didn't say it because I feel like he would. Um, it could be completely normal. But either way, he left and he never showed back up to the dorm room. That next day on the 20th of September, Tom was supposed to get a ride from a friend around noon that day. This friend was a childhood friend and I guess a bunch of them from Sartell would get together and take one car back for the weekend. And he was supposed to visit his family, but he never showed up to this ride. And all of his friends kind of assumed he had just been really drunk the night before. Again, that had been something very typical of Tom the past few weeks. So they left, they didn't question it. They figured he just didn't feel well and didn't wanna take the two two-ish or three-ish hour ride back home. But his parents, however, immediately knew something was not right. When he didn't show up at home, when he was never dropped off, when he never contacted them saying he wasn't gonna be there, they knew something was wrong, so they immediately drove all the way to Fargo, North Dakota to try to see if they could figure out what was going on, where on earth he was, because they had this gut feeling that something just wasn't right. They started reaching out to his friends, they started reaching out to his roommates, and not a single person had seen him since the night before when he left to go somewhere. 
They ended up finding out through a few people that he had actually gone to a party that night and he was at a party at, I believe, and do not quote me on this, I believe it was at his friend Jake's house. Now, Jake was a childhood friend. Um, he was from Sartell and he had a house, I believe, a couple of blocks away from NDSU. He had a roommate in this house named Cody and I'm assuming this is where the party was. I can't say for sure. I haven't seen anything like directly stating it, but based on further events, that's just my assumption. So this was kind of scary because he had had a couple of issues with drinking. I mean, he had made himself sick. He had fallen out of his bed. He ended up, you know, making the decision to drink and drive. So everyone was really scared for his safety at this point. Authorities decided to go ahead and search the area of Jake's home because it was only, I think, about a 16 minute walk from the home up north to NDSU. They're really wouldn't have been anywhere for him to disappear necessarily. It's essentially just a straight shot for the most part. So they figured if he had passed out drunk or something had happened to him, they likely would find him along this route back to NDSU. By Sunday night, the campus ended up releasing to all of the students that Tom had disappeared and they were trying to elicit any tips pretty much. And pretty quickly, the Twitter hashtag find Tom was in circulation and you couldn't get onto Twitter in this area without seeing that everywhere. It was on Twitter, it was on Facebook. Everyone was in this panic trying to find Tom. And these are people that had only known him for a couple of weeks and then a handful of his friends back from home. As time passed, they weren't finding anything in this area, which didn't make a whole lot of sense because they really did believe he had to have been in close vicinity to the campus or to Jake's house. So they decided to go ahead and bring out police dogs and firefighters, pretty much all the officers that they possibly could to more methodically search the area. I'm pretty sure they did some type of grid search looking for him. They wanted to just make sure they hadn't missed anything. They sent alerts out to about 450 property owners within this area as well, asking them to look for Tom in case he ended up in one of their sheds. Maybe he was again too drunk and needed to go to sleep right away way um, but unfortunately no one called in with any signs at all of Tom. By Monday they decided to go ahead and extend their search to the Red River. Now the Red River is pretty much stretches all the way from NDSU campus all the way south. It's an incredibly long river. It's right to the east of campus and there wasn't necessarily any evidence pointing that he somehow ended up in the Red River, but whenever you have an intoxicated person and a body of water nearby, that's typically something that's just searched anyways. And they searched an enormous amount of this river. I think it was from like 12th Street to 35th. So it was a lot of blocks, a lot of area. And this river was really twisty and turny. And unfortunately, they just didn't find anything. So by 5 p.m. on Monday, officers announced they had already searched everywhere, top to bottom, that they believed Tom might be. So they were really pleading to the public at this point to come forward with any information. If anyone had seen Tom, if anyone had spoken to him, if anyone, you know, had been told where he was going or what his plans were later on. They tried to search for him using his phone as well, but unfortunately at this point, Tom's phone was either dead or it was cut off or something had happened to it, but they decided to go ahead and contact the cell company anyways, hoping that maybe they could at least get his last pings to see at least what direction he might have been going to. But until they were able to get that information, they were really just relying on what friends said happened that night and what they were able to find on social media. So they knew he had been at a party that night close to campus and at around 1.23 a.m. on the 20th was the last tweet that left his phone. But the tweet wasn't actually from Tom, it was from Jake, the childhood friend that he was with, the house that I'm pretty sure the party was at. And Jake was tweeting his roommate, Cody. Now, Tom had not known Cody until this night. And the tweet said, dude, it's Jake, come pick us up, call us, and then a phone number. I'm assuming it was more than likely Tom's phone number because Cody wouldn't have had it. And he said, we are so lost and we are going to die. Obviously, this is a terrifying thing to read given the circumstances and the fact that 
they can't find Tom absolutely anywhere. But two different people were able to come forward and say that Tom was in fact okay after this tweet. The first person was a good friend named Pat from back home and they had been Snapchatting each other. And it wasn't just text Snapchats, which could be sent from anybody, but it was actual video Snapchat messages. And they were messaging around 1.30, which is, you know, about seven minutes after the tweet was sent out. So this puts him alive and fine, at least at around 1.30 in the morning. Now, the weird thing about this situation is that they had been talking about wanting to hang out, that, you know, Tom wanted to come and visit him where I think he was at school and it was a great conversation. And Pat last messaged him after 1.30, you know, saying he was excited, he was looking forward to it. But Tom never actually opened that Snapchat. And that's something that I really want you guys to keep in mind because it's one thing that really stuck out to me. Now, the only other person that claims that Tom was all right after 1.30 in the morning was Cody, Jake's roommate. Cody claimed that they somehow ended up back. Now, I have not seen that he received this tweet and he went and got them from wherever they were. All I know is that Cody said they somehow got back to the house. At this point, Cody claims they all just hung out until about 3.40 or 4 in the morning when Tom left on foot. Now, again, at first when I read this, I was like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, why didn't someone take him back? This seems kind of weird. But again, it was only a 16 minute straight shot walk. So I don't think it's all that odd. But either way, what happened next would only make things much more devastating and confusing. It's clear that Tom was alive and well up until at least 1.30. Things get a little bit questionable after that, but supposedly on this walk from Jake and Cody's home to campus, something happened to Tom. But then a tip came in, and this is the one piece of information that I was talking about that has me so caught up and frustrated and confused. A tip randomly came in to authorities that took their search to an RV sales and service business called Larry's RV. So it's literally right on the outskirts of town. It's kind of just like this weird agricultural slash like strange business area. There's just random things there. There's like one home improvement store. And then there's this RV sales lot, like a random photography business. There's just nothing like no like actual shopping center, like no place you would just end up being or want to go. I'm sure half these businesses also would be closed. On top of that, it was so far away and on the outskirts of town, there would have been tons of other places that if he needed to go somewhere and get something real quick, it didn't make sense for him to end up here. But authorities are thinking at this point, why not just go ahead and check this tip out? And sure enough, within 20 minutes of starting the search, Tom's body was found. 20 minutes. That is how specific this tip must have been. Granted, his body was kind of just out in the open. It didn't appear as if the body was concealed in any way, shape, or form. But it was just bizarre that it would be in the middle of this RV lot. Now, while it is a 45 minute walk to get to this location, it's a 16 minute drive, but we know that he left on foot. So he either was picked up or something willingly or unwillingly, the walk would have been insane. I have walked it many different times on Google Maps, many different ways you can get there. It literally makes no sense. I think someone that's even heavily intoxicated would gather pretty quickly they were going in the wrong direction. But either way, the area is just strange. And one thing that also stuck out to me is that it's right off of I-94. So it's right off of an interstate as if someone had been heading out of town or at least trying to get as far to the edge of town as possible. Everyone took a huge hit when this information came out. I know I spoke a little bit about Tom in the beginning, but I didn't really talk about how much exactly everybody loved him. Like I have never, since I started this channel, I've never seen so many articles just dedicated to, you know, friend after friend after friend after peer after, you know, coach, just 
pour out onto these articles and in these interviews how much the, uh, someone changed their life. Like it was just the most insane thing I've ever seen. I have everything linked down below so you can go and see for yourself. He was so well known for so many different reasons. He's got quotes that he made everywhere, inspirational quotes to people. His previous high school had to send out an alert to all of the students to make them aware after the press conference so that they didn't find out in some other way. That's how many people knew about him, that his previous high school alerted everyone because all these students, for the most part, knew exactly who he was. He was on the varsity basketball team. You know, he was very well known. They were all devastated. They had to make sure they brought in all their counselors. They sent out alerts to the parents as well so they knew what would happen when their kids got home that night, what information they would come home with. It was devastating to the people in Sartell, every single person that knew him. And even after only four weeks of being at NDSU, the students were shocked and devastated. People that had only spoken to him a few times that said he was genuinely one of the nicest, most, you know, personable people they'd ever met. Everyone was devastated. But unfortunately, all of those people that loved and looked up to him would only have more questions than answers and still to this day only have questions. When the autopsy came back, everyone was trying to figure out what happened. Was it an accident? Did, you know, what on earth is going on? His death was labeled homicidal violence. I don't know about you guys and please let me know down in the comments below. I have never heard that specific term used before as a death classification. John Lorden in his video said he's never heard that used as a classification. You can't find a definition of that really online anywhere. To me that says, and to everyone that I've spoken to about this so far, there was something very horrific and unique about his death. They will not release what exactly happened to him, the state of his body. They will release none of that, which again just supports the idea that something about this was so unique and they need to protect the integrity of the case. The only thing that they have released is that his death was not from alcohol, it was not from drugs. So that also leads me to believe that he wasn't all that intoxicated. Another thing that they have stated is that there were two things that they expected to find when they found Tom's body. And here we are, years later, the items still haven't been found. He wore a nine and a half white Nike Air Jordan and those were his shoes he was wearing the night he disappeared, the night that he was murdered, and the left one was missing, along with his silver iPhone 5. Now, they searched methodically all around the campus, all around Jake's house. They searched methodically the RV sales lot. How did they not find the shoe and the phone? Now, my personal thoughts on this I do not believe he walked there. I believe he was somehow picked up, tricked by someone, thrown in a car, and I honestly believe the only reason these things haven't been found is because there likely was some sort of struggle in a vehicle, either to get him in or to get him out, and phone fell out of the pocket, he dropped his phone, and maybe the shoe came off when this happened as well. And then whoever did this now has his shoe, has his phone, and they disposed of it so that no one could find it. I don't think these are items that were taken as souvenirs. To me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I genuinely believe some sort of struggle happened and that's how both of these items are gone. Now, I don't think a killer would have thought to pick them up and then remove them from the scene. Why not just leave them there? That's why I personally strongly believe these things came out in a vehicle. Now, leave your other theories with that down below because these are like the only bits of information in this case that we have. Authorities are keeping everything tight for a very, very good reason, but these things are keeping me up at night. 
Searches continued and the family and authorities kept begging the public to come forward with anything, but unfortunately, not much happened. In July of 2015, people started to come forward even stronger, asking for those that were close to the situation to come forward with any information they might have. This to me is when things get a little bit sketchy. Tom's girlfriend posted to Facebook upset and she posted this big status about how those close to the case, including someone that was last known to be with him, were not cooperating with police and would not take a polygraph test. Now, everyone has very strong opinions about taking polygraph tests. Most people know do not agree to take one. Um, lawyers will tell you not to take one. It's not admissible in court, so it's not like they could use it against you in a sense of if you were to be put on trial or anything, but they use it to kind of rule people out. It didn't make sense to a lot of people that the last people, at least one of them, known to be with Tom, was not cooperating with police. Whether they take a polygraph test or not, it was strange they didn't want to answer any questions. And then the other person that apparently was one of the last people, uh, again, we're speaking of pretty much Jake and Cody, uh, they were confronted, someone went to their door to ask them questions and they said they had nothing to tell them and shut the door. So the last two people are essentially just acting very, very questionable. And this caused a gigantic argument on Facebook when Tom's girlfriend finally stepped up and said something about it. I think Jake's girlfriend was involved in this fight saying all these different things, a whole bunch of different replies ended up getting deleted. It caused so many issues that the following day, Tom's parents ended up releasing a statement simply asking for those same people to cooperate and to come forward. It's difficult for authorities to move on in a case when they can't rule very specific people out. When someone is murdered, the very first people you wanna to speak to and question and rule out are the last people to see that person. And when those people are not cooperating, it looks bad, it, it just does. There's really no way to get around that. But it's making it really hard for authorities to kind of move on. In September of 2015, I don't think anyone had come forward still, and authorities did not have a suspect. They didn't even have a possible motive. So they decided to consult with an FBI behavioral analyst unit to hopefully at least narrow down different scenarios and possible suspects and possibly profile who would do something like this. They decided to actually focus on one specific suggestion that was made during this meeting, and it meant meeting with medical examiners to clarify certain terms the doctors that performed Tom's autopsy had used. Now, I don't know if that has to do with the cause of death being labeled homicidal violence. Um, I don't know, but it's interesting. That's the only information we really have on this lead. I guess there are some strange things that they said happened with the body or in relation to the body, and these terms were enough to make authorities want to figure out more about it. So far to this day, we are unsure if there is a suspect, person of interest, if they finally have found a motive or if they're any further along in the case, because again, authorities are keeping everything really, really tight to the vest. Tom's family has taken this in stride. They trust law enforcement fully. They know they are doing what they need to. It's not a situation where authorities aren't speaking and they're also leaving the family out. Tom's family can call authorities whenever they want and they will happily talk to them. They just let them know there's information that they can't give them simply to protect their case because they so badly want justice for Tom. They want to find out who did what to him. And his family took things into their own hands as well when it comes to helping the community, keeping Tom's name in the public, and keeping up with safety. Seven months after Tom's death, his family came up with the Tom Beerson Foundation, and there's a website where his family raises money for different scholarships and to support different programs that Tom himself would have been passionate about, from sports to even safety programs that are targeting high school students that are going from high school to college to hopefully prevent something like this from happening to anybody else. It's a pretty cool website. I have looked over the entire thing. It explains the different scholarships that 
that it's giving to students under Tom's name. It's, it describes the different programs and there's even a pie chart at the very bottom of the website that shows how much money has specifically gone to what and the total of the amount of money that they have raised so far. So it's a good thing to kind of see what you're contributing towards, to understand how you're helping people, how much you're helping people exactly. And I think it's an absolutely awesome thing that they're doing with the Tom Beerson Foundation. It's always something that hits me so hard when I see a family that has gone through so much and still has no answers and has to fight on a daily basis with the death of their own child. To see them turn that into something so beautiful and amazing that is so beneficial to other people I feel like this entire case from top to bottom is so tragic, but to see how much people have chosen to celebrate his life over his death is astounding. And you just don't see things like that very often. His family said, and I quote, the most beautiful part of all of this is that our son didn't die in vain. There's a lot of good that came out of his life. I can't imagine the kind of balance that it takes to keep pushing for answers, but refusing to also dwell on someone's death, knowing that their life meant so much more. It's just something you don't typically see in cases like this. It is so hard and you can get so stuck in what happened and searching for answers and being sad and upset and confused. So... I have the utmost respect for his family, for this entire community. I think this is the only case I've ever stumbled upon where I've seen this many people just genuinely love someone so much, so much more than what happened to them and focus so much on the good things that he did and how they he impacted them. And I honestly really suggest you guys go down below and look at my sources and read some of the different articles. Go visit the foundation website, hear what his parents had to say about him and his story. And it's interesting because on their website page, they have his story. There's one paragraph about what happened to him and the rest of it is just him being a kid and the good things he did and the bad things he did and how it made him him and how it made him unique and how it changed their lives. Everyone just misses Tom terribly and they all want justice. They need closure. They desperately need this closure. If you were to go to Sartell right now, you would see people wearing these bright wristbands saying, in loving memory of Tommy B. If you were to meet a handful of his closest friends, you would notice tattoos on them that said TB1 after his name and his basketball number. No one is letting his story die, but it's in such a different way than you typically would see. And I just think it is the most beautiful thing I have seen to date. This is one of those cases that will stick with you forever for so many different reasons. I have so many questions. I know there are a lot of eyes on the last people that were known to be with Tom. Um, I mean, I don't know. I personally believe something happened before 340. I just have this gut feeling where, you know, if he's not going to open a Snapchat after 1.30 and he was supposedly just hanging out, just sitting on the couch and chilling at someone's house, I just don't believe he wouldn't have opened that. If he was having this, you know, kind of not emotional, but this kind of bonding, you know, conversation with one of his childhood friends about how much he missed him and, you know, I want to hang out with you and all these things back and forth. And then all of a sudden he just stops around the same time that someone else is using his phone and then his phone isn't found on his body later. Something about that just doesn't sit right with me. Let me know what your theories are down below. I hope and pray that his family gets the justice that they deserve. They've said so many times in interviews and in articles, the person that did this has to wake up every morning and know what they did. They have to live their life with the weight of what they did and that to them and right now at least is all they need to know to know that that person's not living free technically please if you can share this video or share this story to anyone that you possibly can again i believe pressure is going to do a lot in this case there is likely someone that saw something or there is someone that knows something 
people tend to leak out bits of information over time after something like this happens. It's something that's difficult for people to keep to themselves. So someone out there might've heard something that sounded like a joke, but when you put everything together, it honestly might not be. Any little tip at this point can help the police department to solve who on earth killed Tom Beerson. Now there is a podcast out there who Killed Tommy, I have that linked as well down below. Also, I have John Lorden's video linked down below. Um, you can get a little bit more information there, but unfortunately, I've pretty much wrapped up everything that's out to the public right now. I wanna go ahead and thank you guys for taking the time out of your day to listen to Tom's story and for being a part of this channel with me and sharing the same passion that I do to bring justice to these people who so deserve it. Thank you guys so much. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already to become a part of the Helen fam so that we can hopefully bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.